Nicole Soller, and I would be your Director of Crowdfunding and Digital Assets at Qualia Computing. And this presentation is a values proposal for the business. And I'm going to do my best to keep it under an hour long, but feel free to pause the video at any time if you need a break or need to double check something. Uh, you can view it on your phone, your tablet, your computer, or your TV. It's probably best viewed on a bigger device, somewhere where you can see everything that's going on. And feel free to take notes if you need. All right, let's get started. Okay, we are going to start off with what is a value. A value is something that is held in regard, uh, held to deserve. When something is held in high regard, it means it's of importance. So in the core of a business, you can usually find their values in their mission statement. So I've put together a matrix of the word values. So these are the things we're going to cover in today's lesson. So we're going to start off with vision. Then we're going to move into the authentic assets. Then we're going to move into leadership. Then the unitary matrix. Then equitability. And then sustainability. Okay, we're going to start with the vision. So the vision would be the overall expected direction that the company would be going. So an example of a really good mission statement would be something like our mission is to satisfy the human desires through collective collaboration. A more technical example would be something like serving the human conscious through engagement and imaginative thinking, or in simpler terms, creating the imaginative thinkers. So to make a clear mission statement, we want to make sure that we keep it simple. We use little to very few wording. We want to make sure it's straight to the point. We want to make sure the consumer understands it. And they should be able to understand directly what the business is and does just by reading the mission statement. So although it might not be clear to the point exactly what we are doing, they should understand our overall intention. The next part of vision is the branding. So the branding is probably the most important thing that gets the overall company noticed. So when it comes to branding, we want to have a cohesive look for the company. We want to have a logo that matches the color scheme. We want to have fonts that are consistent. And we're going to need something called a vision statement. So a vision statement is basically a short description of the company that any investor or consumer could understand just by reading it in one full sentence. So an example of something like this would look like the world's best place to connect with your conscious from a mobile device. Or we focus on bringing happiness and conscious to the development to the world. Or something even simpler, like we focus on bringing happiness and creative thinking. It's, it's something really simple, something really easy, something that's easy to understand and develop in your mind as something that you could almost have repetition in your mind to continuously think. So another thing is when I, when I bring up the point of repetition, we want something that people are going to consistently hear. Or when they think about that sentence, they think about us. So I've put together, these are two examples for branding of icons that can be used that are simplified that could be something that uh, is good for the sensories, is good for the cortex. So uh, your cortex is responsible for your memory and your mind. It's also responsible for your conscientiousness, your thought, your emotion, your reasoning, your language. Uh, humans have the largest cortex of developmental animals, so when we see something and we remember it, we want to make sure that it's something that is consistent in our brains. So for creative assets, things that can help do that would be things like logos, color schemes. So when they think of a certain color, they think of us, or when they think of a certain image, they think of us. Ideally, we'd like to keep it gender neutral. The reason being we're not gender specific. We're catering to an entire market of people. Age isn't even a factor for the most part. So we want to make sure that these are colors that are gender, not gender specific, but more gender neutral to the entire audience or our target markets. 
and we want to keep it simple and creative. We want, don't want something that's kind of blinding the eye. We want to make sure that it's really easy on the eye. You could look at it through your mobile device uh, at night, in the morning, midday, and it doesn't give any kind of different reaction. So feel free to use these icons at your leisure. They are not proprietary to us. They are something I just put together. So these are available options for the future. Okay, moving on with the brand. So for the vision and the brand, these are some of the creative assets that we have that allow us to sort of identify ourselves in the market. So the first thing is a website. A website is a given these days. All websites should be mobile accessible. Uh, for a website, we want to make sure we have an about us or a what we are page, something that really corely explains exactly what it is that we do and who we are, what our mission is, uh, what we're setting out to accomplish. We also want to have a support or a contact page or a fax page, something with technical support if needed, something where the consumer feels comfortable visiting us and comfortable getting in contact with us if there's anything that they need or need to know. Uh, the primary element of a website is the splash page. So the splash page is an index page. So it's the first thing you see when you enter the website. It's going to be the logo, the branding, any kind of banner images, any kind of mission statement, any kind of marketing that's going on. And then there would ultimately be a navigation pane at the top or mid page, so anything above the fold. And then what we could have is a products page. So this could be products or services. So it's basically what we're building. What are we doing? What are we offering? What technological pursuits are we innovating in at the time? Another thing that we um, really want to focus on is the employees. So we have career options, but we also have a list of employees that are willing to kind of expose themselves on the web, I guess you could say. So these would be the employees that currently work at the company, at the very least in high volume um, positions. And then the next thing would be the content. So the content is the overall focus of the website. It's basically what is the website bringing? What is it that you can find on the website that can be useful information for people? What is it that they can do? Is there free things that we offer them? Is there anything that they can engage with that it's going to give them more peace of mind or give them more information about the company? And then moving along, we have the press room or some people call it media or promotions. So these are basically any kind of promotional media that we've had exposure in, in the past or in the present. So if we are, say, on the news for some reason, or we have got a press release um, in a magazine or within another tech company, we want to make sure we post that and we highlight all of those um, basically exposed elements that have brought us to where we are today. We also want to make sure we offer our services in the very least English and French. So we are a Canadian based company right now. So our two primary languages are English and French. It could be moved to Spanish if we move more along uh, the South into the States. But those are the two things we want to show that we can diversify ourselves. So we want to show that we can offer services in both English and French. Uh, one more key element to probably the footer, which is the bottom part of the website, would be the privacy statement. We want to make sure that we do have a privacy statement, maybe a cookies agreement, something where we are letting users know that their information is protected on our site while visiting our site. That's a really important element. Almost 99% of websites tend to have them, so it's something we really need to make sure that we have. Another suggestion, not a requirement, but a suggestion is having a blog. So most websites these days do have blogs. And the reason for that is, is blogs give you consistent updates on search engines. So although the content is not for everybody every day, 
you might find something that would be really relevant or interesting to you that would be important to sort of know about. So keeping a blog allows you to basically keep informed of what's going on on the site, within the company, and what new developments are happening. And also information that might be important in the world. So it could be anything. Anything tech related, anything computing related, uh, we would post that on the blog and it allows us to stay relevant in search engines for consistently updating the site. We can attach the blog to the website so that it's still under the same domain name and it gives them points of interest. So, so it gives them, um, th there would be the relevant company would be the main part and then once we build the app and launch an app that app would have its own website and own blog to go along with it but it would still connect back to the core company which would be us so moving along from the creative assets now we're going to move into our authentic assets so Ideas are not proprietary, but implementing them is. That's a really important statement because coming up with ideas is one thing, but actually implementing them into our overall system and market is a little bit more challenging. So what do we have that's proprietary versus what's common or standard? So you hear the term a lot, industry standard these days, especially around the technology world. So when it comes to industry standards, what's been what's been made to be stable, what's been made to be common, what do have we generally accepted as technology uses. So I've put together two logos over here of the company, for example. So if we were to use these logos, these are the basic creative assets we have. These are the design, this is the image, this is the font, this is the colors. And it's an industry standard logo, so it's something we can build our entire business around. Again, feel free to use these. The bigger picture. So the bigger picture would be what is proprietary to us? What do we have that differentiates us from other companies? What do we have to offer that makes us unique? So what's an absolute yes in the company versus an absolute no? It's really easy to say, well, we don't have any absolute no's. We either is we're open and to absolutely anything. We want to be we want people to be creative thinkers. We want to have lots of ideas, but there are certain things, uh, both legally, morally, that we just simply have to say no to. It's 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 just the reality of business. So, in that perspective, there are things that we want to be an absolute yes. We want to say yes to new innovative ideas that really change those industry standards things where when you don't want to say no to what's common you you want to say yes to new innovations you want to say yes to new ideas you want to say yes we can do it a better way why didn't we think of that earlier and what new ideas are collectively going to shape our beliefs so if we come up with a really great idea that replaces something like group chats or um, main page timetables, things like that. These are something the user, the overall consumer is going to have to get used to. So what's a really good way that we could implement that into our system that collectively shapes the beliefs of the masses? And how is our app going to change technology for the better? How are we going to help people? So the big, the big, picture in everything essentially is how is this going to benefit? How is this going to make us better? How is this going to improve the quality of life overall? We, will, we want to make sure that we're constantly improving and not hindering. So it's different for consumers. You know, we all know what we don't know. We know we don't know something, but it's important to recognize what a consumer already knows versus what they don't know. So taking those into account is, well, consumers generally don't know 
every little detail and spec that goes into building something, every little detail and spec that goes into building a piece of technology. So the developers, on the developer's end, they could be looking at something for months and months and months and be really comfortable with the platform and be like, oh, no, this will be easy for consumers to use. They're going to get it right away. It's not that simple. UI development comes with the ease of use, the ease of access. Consumers don't want to be clicking 10 different buttons to get something. They want to make sure it's simple, to the point, clear. They don't want to be digging for information. And we don't want to enforce that because we don't want them to get frustrated from using our app just looking for something, just because we want to keep them on longer. We want to make sure that it's easy and that they get it right away, they're finding the information they need, and if they realize that it's that easy, they're gonna keep coming back. So another thing to keep in mind is legalities tend to pop up unexpectedly. So we could be named, our business name could be Quality or Qualia Computing, and then another company could come up called the Qualia Group. And there's not too much we can do about that. We we can't really argue it because the businesses are two separate businesses. So we need to make sure that we have a business model that's cohesive, people can remember, and stands on its own two feet. Essentially, we want to make sure that our brand is so well known that no matter what arises, we can overcome that hurdle. So a few of our digital assets would be proprietary solutions to technical innovations. So the app itself, any kind of innovative uh, code that we come up with, code is not patentable, but our UI, our code, the second it's compiled or implemented is automatically bound by copyright law. So we have that kind of protection to keep us going and moving forward. Digital assets could include social media accounts, images, videos, frameworks, text files, source files, apps, web pages, emails, etc. Anything the company holds information on is a digital asset. The branding online is also considered a digital asset. Another form of digital assetting is campaigns. So campaigns is a part of our marketing and advertising strategy. So campaigns, excuse me, are a form of digital assets through marketing strategy. They can include videos, promotional images, advertisements, and media. So a campaign could look something like new discovery, whales generate electricity in the ocean, share your thoughts today, join for a free trial. That's a really simplistic way of advertising on something like a social media site and getting users encouraged to join the company or join the app. Uh, digital assets, they tend to flow uh, income and expenditure or hold and generate content to the consumer. So essentially what that means is digital assets would be generating us revenue. So when we post an advertisement, it's going to bring in new consumers, it's going to help generate us income, but it also continuously advertising allows us to keep and hold our current consumers by making sure it's like, hey, we're still here. If you think about us, you know, come come get on the app again. Let's let's remind you how awesome we are. That's really important to make sure that we hold the consumers that we already have for the long term while also still building new customers as much as we can. So another good example of a campaign would be it's Black History Month. Share your thoughts and input and sign up today. So Black History Month is something that comes around every year. So it's something that we can sort of build upon year after year to keep those customers coming back. So I'm going to show you a few examples of what a campaign would look like on social media sites. So the rate of investment or the rate of return is based on the quality of the ad. So we could advertise on Facebook, for example, for so many dollars, get so many impressions, and nobody could click. So we're basically spending money for the impression, but we're not developing that consumer. So we want to make sure that our actual rate of investment is returning to us the value that we're putting in. 
Another way of doing it would be something like Instagram where we could post digital images just promoting the company and suggesting in the description that you sign up today and here's the reason why. Um, another thing is consistently promoting the blog. The blog offers more uh, opportunity for interest so it offers new information so constantly advertising just to get the name out there is really really important okay we're moving into leadership now so leadership is the L in our values matrix so these are some personal values of mine that I like to keep uh, pointing out that I think are really important in uh, business structure and the overall leadership of a business. So inclusion in the workplace is a key one. We want to make sure that we are very inclusive. We're not excluding anybody from anything and everyone has their voice heard. Appreciation of others. Being grateful for the work that everyone does and making sure that they know that their value as an employee is met. And respect goes a long way, which is a given. Respect is key and fundamental human right and principle. And having shared values and integrities, uh, we're all consistently on the same page in the sense that we're just trying to bring the success of the company out. We want to make sure the overall outcome is the success of the business. Active listening, that's another one. Great leaders tend to be great listeners. So we want to make sure that we hear and we listen to one another and we hear what the other person's saying, what their input is, because everybody's perception of the world is different and everybody develops new ideas based on their own perception. So there's always added value in that. There's always added value in, you know, hearing what someone else has to say because they're coming from a different world than you. You know, their mind is a different place. So we want to make sure that we have good active listening. And we want to make sure that we take time for self-care because we don't want burnout. Burnout in technology is a really big problem, especially today. People tend to, you know, sometimes there can be a lot of ego around technology and we don't want that. We're not looking for that. We want to make sure that, you know, developers and engineers are always taking that time for self-care. We want to make sure that everyone in the business, you know, knows how to take care of themselves and knows what's best for them. And if they need a break, that they have the availability to do that. And group and team-based projects is a really great way to have people interact with one another. So when you get new employees, especially with remote work now that the pandemic pandemic's kind of over, there is a lot of at-home remote work. So we want to make sure that there's still opportunity for group and team-based projects where people can collectively work together and share ideas and share new information. And great communication is a given. We want to make sure that there's always good communication flow going on within the business. No one's getting left out. No one's getting left behind. There's no one veering off into, you know, space world. We want to make sure that we're all sort of in this together and our mission still stands as one unified tribe. And engagement of ideas and areas of interest. So that's, we, we want to make sure that everyone is doing something they love. We want to make sure that everyone loves what they're doing. And if there is opportunity for growth or opportunity to move into a different team or move into a different direction or a role within the company, we want to make sure that we offer that role. Now, the big goals of leadership are sharing goals and ideas. So many people have a desire to be rich, but not many people actually want it. That's a really great statement because a lot of people, you know, they have this concept in their head, well, I want to be really rich one day, but it's, it's not the reality of things. Many, most people, if anything, are really content in their home life. They're really content, you know, being blue collar, not, not exactly poverty stricken, but most people are really content just being at bay with things. They, they don't want the hassle. They don't want the headache. They don't want, um, basically the stress that goes along with high finances. And another thing is fear is an illusion. So being mindful of the fact that fear is a commonality in a lot of people. So many people, when a company is first starting off, especially in start startups, especially around technology, there's a lot of fear because there's so much pressure to dominate the market in a really short amount of time. We don't, we don't want to exhibit that in any capacity. 
So just remembering that fear is an overall illusion. It's not something that's real. You know, there's a great statement that's, you know, nobody knows better than you. The world is built by people who know no better than you. I think it was Steve Jobs that said that. But it's a, it's really true. It's really true. There are people who, yes, have been in the industry for 20, 30 years, but the market and technology especially is changing day by day. And there's nobody that says... Uh, you have to do it this way. There's there's nothing. There's nothing that's stopping us from continuously being innovative, continuously trying new things, and continuously bringing those opportunities to the market to show people, like, would you be interested in this? Supporting the advancement of AI. So, again, I talked to Cameron about this. There is a lot of fear sometimes around the advancement of AI. There is sometimes this stigma that it's, you know, intelligence is going to be smarter than us one day and that's not necessarily true humans consistently continue to grow and adapt and evolve so over thousands and thousands maybe even millions of years we have continued to evolve we've continued to dominate the earth um, we're not going anywhere anytime soon so the advancement of ai is just an opportunity to make us continuously smarter and we want to tap into that we want to make sure that we are constantly being on top of our game and if there's something that we can learn that we learn it staying positive and open-minded it's key to life you know you want to you want to do your best to stay positive whether or not you're someone who believes that positive thinking controls or adapts your life um, all around, it's just we want a positive atmosphere, an open-minded environment, something where people can prosper and grow and be better and happy. Happy is a big one. And only judge your own behavior and keep others out of it. So that's a really important one when it comes to, you know, if you're having a bad day, we, we don't want to bring that into, you know, the company, we want to make sure that you're kind of checking yourself. There's no one that's going to do that for you. It's certainly not going to be me. I'm not going to, you know, call you out on bad behavior, but I want to make sure that everyone is kind of holding themselves accountable. It's important to be the next one, emotionally intelligent and responsible. You need to be able to be aware of your own reaction to things, your own behavior, and continuously be responsible. You know, as this is a company, it is a business, and it's important to make sure that we're all sort of in check and that we are doing our very best and presenting ourselves in the best way possible. And vulnerability is a positive, not a negative. So this is a great one because, you know, sometimes we get people who are very passive-aggressive, and we, we don't want that at all. We want people who can be vulnerable, who can say, I don't know how to do this. I don't I don't know what I'm doing. I'm really scared. I, I don't feel comfortable doing this. Is there something else I can do? That vulnerability is going to get you into a position where you feel your best and where you feel like you can thrive. And you want to make sure that you have that and you have leaders in the company that can exhibit that as well. So it's really important to keep in mind that vulnerability is more of an asset than it is a detriment. And embrace honest feedback. So honest feedback can look something like, uh, I don't think that's a good idea and here's why. Um, not honest feedback is you're in a bad mood one day and you're just like, no, I don't want to deal with that. Like you, you, gotta, you gotta remember that the honest feedback is a comprehension of your thoughts and the reality of the situation. So you wanna make sure that you're really when you're giving feedback or you're receiving feedback, you have to understand exactly where that's coming from. And you have to sort of be able to develop it in your minds and say like, okay, I can really understand what this person's saying and what they mean by that. And finally, for leadership, these are some of the core values. They're just words that can kind of resonate and stick in your mind that are really important to overall uh, develop and be within yourself. So confidence is a big one. Confidence, the, sometimes the key to successful businesses come from confidence. That self-love, that self-confidence is not something that's easily built. It's not naturally adapted. It's something we have to sort of build over time. So whether you're new in the industry or you're someone who's been there a long time, it comes from kind of knowing yourself, being true to who you are. 
So you want to do your best to be confident in every way you can. Another one is trust. This goes along with the fear. You know, if you're someone who's not naturally trusting, that's perfectly fine. But you want to make sure like trust has to come at some point. You have to be able to trust the outcome. You have to be able to trust the people you work with. You have to know that the people you work with are good at what they do. And you need to be able to believe in them and trust in them to do their job just as much as they need to be able to believe in you to do your job. Uh, integrity. Integrity is a, is a great one because if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's a really, really great statement. In, in, a, in a sense of a whole, if you, if you don't believe deeply in what you're doing, you're more likely to go along and get along than actually innovate and come up with something new. So instead of following, if there is something that you maybe aren't overly confident about, but you kind of think it's a good idea, still say it. Like we, we still want to hear it. We still want to know about it because sometimes those childlike mentalities bring the best innovations. You want that youthfulness because that youthfulness brings honesty and it's the honesty that brings the best ideas, brings up the most in innovative and inventive ideas. So, and sometimes getting that comes with maturity. Um, as you get older, you sort of get younger in a sense because you sort of develop this like, I don't care what anybody thinks of me attitude. So if you're new into the industry and you're kind of like feeling a little bit more intimidated, don't worry about it. Everyone's new at some point. Not everybody, people who've been in the industry for 15, 20 years, they're still figuring it out. So it comes with maturity, not with age. The next one is honesty. So we want to make sure that you keep it honest. Um, you don't need to hide around the bush with anybody. Nobody's out to get you. Nobody's out to hurt anybody. We're all just doing our best. We're all in this together. And we just want to make sure that everyone's being as honest as possible. The next one is love. So love is, you can't do anything in this world properly without love. I, I'm a firm believer of that. The best intentions, the best kind of affection and moral standing comes from a place of love. The most successful companies come from building a world based around love. So things that are going to benefit people, things that are going to help people, things that may really express your genuine compassion for humankind. So essentially... You know, going around saying, oh, I hate all people. It's it's not it's not exactly a mentality that's going to spark the love of humanity for people. And technology, especially in its current state and its current surroundings, we really need to embody that essence of love in order to make sure that everything that's getting developed is being developed in an honest and fruitful way. Uh, the next one is leadership. So that's obvious to what this all is. The best leaders are listeners. Like I said previously, you want to make sure you're a good leader. You want to make sure you're a good listener. You want to make sure at the very least you want to be the leader that you expect to receive. So if, you know, I'm doing something wrong or somebody else is doing something wrong, how would you handle that first and foremost? Before going to anybody else, how would you handle that? How would you want it to be handled? Uh, the next one is mastery. So be passionate about what you do. You gotta love what you do. You gotta really be ingrained in it. You really want you want to master your skills, but more than that, you want to be the master of your own domain. You want to be able to control yourself. You want to be able to control your thoughts, control your mind, control your thinking, and be completely in tune with who you are as a person in order to master everything you have to offer the world. Uh, the next one is understanding. So. This one comes with being understanding of others and understanding that all others come from a different place in a different world than you. That's really, really important and I cannot stress it enough. Not everyone thinks the same. Just because you were raised down the street from, you know, Sarah or Joe doesn't mean that everybody thinks like you, Sarah and Joe. Everybody comes from a different place around the world. And it's really important to keep that in mind that people were raised in different environments. People were raised in different places. People were raised with different incomes. People were raised with different households, parents, siblings, all of that. So it's really important to be understanding and conscientious about uh, your environment and the people you work around. Uh, the next thing is wealth. So the concept of I am free. 
So wealth, uh, when we first think about it, automatically we think of money, obviously. And then we also think of intellect and intelligence, no, so knowledge. So wealth can come in the form of being rich, but it can also come in the form of being rich in life. So we want to make sure that we are expressing as a company that we are fruitful, we are free, we bring freedom to the person. And that's really a huge embodiment of what the company is about. So freedom of expression is one thing. Freedom of self is another. So if we have a virtual assistant that's helping us express you as a person, we want to make sure that that virtual assistant is really wealthy in the knowledge of you. So that's really important to kind of keep in mind, keep in the back of your head that the concept of I am free, this frees me, this allows me to be who I am and express to the world who I am in an easier way. And the next one is power. So power to me is the key of life. Um, so I am one with myself. So if we are offering the virtual assistant, we want to make sure that that virtual system has the power and you still have the power to control it. So the idea of this would be to, I am now the master of my own domain. I am now the master of my own life. And here are the tools that I use to make that happen, make that available to me, to make that possible in my life. Okay, we are moving on to the next, which is our you, and that is the unitary matrix. So if you are a math lover or you're familiar at all with math, um, then you probably have already heard of this term. A unitary matrix is something where the conjugate is equal to the inverse. So the bad essentially is equal to the good. So the positive is equal to the negative. So bad actors, for example, Cameron brought up the karma system. Uh, they shed light on our weaknesses in our business model. Essentially, when we are building something, so when we are building something, we, um, we want to make sure that the good outweighs the bad, but the good also good is almost relevant to the bad. So we want to make sure, well, this happened, it's a bad thing, but at the same time, it opens up new doors for us to innovate and become creative in solutions so that this doesn't happen again in the future and maybe we'll come up with something that is better than everybody else. Uh, and then understanding the real relationships versus the imaginary ones. So it's one thing to develop a relationship with a consumer uh, and it's another thing to have this sort of imaginary concept of what a consumer will be in your mind. So the freedom of expression, for example, is um, more important for the most part than the ability to control the outcome. So when someone comes and uses our app, essentially what they're going to be looking for is how is this going to benefit me? What am I getting out of this? Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot different than the concept of I am going to control your life. I, if you use this app, I'm going to make it so easy for you to do X, Y, and Z. It's a very different thing when they're like, no, 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 I don't want you to do X, Y, and Z. I want you to do this, that, and the other thing. So understanding that the real relationship with the consumer is based around what they want. So essentially, we want to make sure that the consumer is getting value for their time. We want to make sure that what we're offering them is the value in their life. We are essentially an assistant in their life. We are taking on the role of being a parent, a sibling, a friend, an enemy, all of it in their life. So it's, we, we want to make sure that we understand those roles and we develop those real relationships and not the concept of what we think it should be in our own heads. Another thing is sometimes consumers say they'll do one thing and then they end up doing another. So this can boil down to simply using the app. They say they're going to do something, they download the app, they purchase it, whatever, with the intention of using it every single day. You know, it's, it's a weight loss thing, for example, is another great example. So, you know, they say one minute they're really motivated, you know, after Thanksgiving, they're like, I'm going to go out on a diet, I'm not going to eat for like however long, I'm going to eat healthy or whatever. I'm going to exercise. And then, you know, two or three weeks down the road, they're like, I don't feel like it anymore. 
We want to make sure that we hold that engagement. That's really, really important. We need to make sure that we have something that's consistently, you know, the word addiction gets thrown around, but it's, it's really, it's not an addiction. It's not an obsession. It's nothing like that. It's nothing unhealthy. What it is, is a solution to boredom. So essentially when the average consumer gets bored or they don't want to do something and they're, or they're looking to kind of fulfill that, fulfill Fill in that time frame. We want to make sure that we're the ones that they think of. We're the ones that they want to engage with. We have something to offer that brings them positivity to their life and makes them happy. And it's important to focus on the consumers that show a little bit of engagement versus the ones that show none. People that show no engagement tend to have zero interest or they're just, it's not the right time in their life or they've got other things going on. But the consumers who show a little bit of engagement are just kind of looking for that extra bit of love. Sometimes they really just want uh, a little bit more attention. They need something that really reel them back in. And you're going to more likely, from a marketing perspective, you're more likely going to get uh, more engagement out of the ones that show a little bit than the ones that show none. And again, a big one, you've probably heard it before, is fail forward. Uh, failure is a win too. So failure, certain big companies actually look for failures because failures are opportunities for growth. It offers offers up new opportunity. It offers up innovation to new ideas and just new structures overall. So we really want to make sure that um, we understand our consumers, we understand where we're going, and we understand what we have to offer. Okay, the next one in our values matrix is equitability. So equitability is the concept of is it fair? Is it fair to us and is it fair to the consumer? Um, so if the app is assumingly fair to all parties involved, how does it benefit consumers in the short run versus the long run? So in the short run, we could get... We have the app, we can get consumers to the app, they can use it for a week and all the cool features are there and they've used them all. And then what happens after that? For the long run, we want to make sure that we have, we, we're able to hold their attention. We're constantly offering new ideas. We're constantly offering new engagement opportunities. We, it's really important that the business model and the app model is something where they can keep coming back and getting that same satisfaction that's either equal to or greater than what they've already received. Is the app going to be engaging enough to consumers? So how and why does it hold the consumer's attention? These are questions we need to ask. What is it about the app that's holding their attention versus what's not really working? How long is the user expected to use the app? per interaction. So if I'm going on the app, how long am I expected to use it? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour? How long is my engagement going to be? If I need to use the app for an hour just to get one thing done, then I'm going to need to make that hour available in my life. If I only need five minutes, it's easier to get someone's attention for five minutes six times a day than it is for to get their attention, you know, once for 30 minutes. So it, the short run is almost the bigger picture win, but at the same time, we want to make sure that they're continuously coming back. So what is it that's going to hold their attention to make them want to come back? And can they use it during rest time and busy time? So I think this is one of the bigger benefits we have with ours is that uh, it's something that's available. It's offering new opportunities. It's offering new adventure. We want to, people to not feel so glued to their phone, but we want to be able to spark that interest in new available opportunities for adventure in their life. So if there's something that we can help them do better to spare that time being on their phone, we want to make sure that we're doing our best as an assistant to do that. And how often will they need the app? So wanting and needing are two different things. Wanting something is the concept of this would be really cool to have right now. Needing it would be I, I can't accomplish this task without this. So if you've got someone, there's the difference between someone who is older and someone who is younger. So if we're engaging with a 17-year-old and then a 56-year-old. 
So the 56 year old is going to say, well, I need to visit my mom. She's in the hospital. Can you help me do that? Whereas the 17 year old is going to be like, well, I want to hang out with my friends Friday night. How can I do that? Um, my friends are now a priority versus my family is a priority. So the target audience is really going to need that assistance in what they find important. Okay, we're going to start getting into money just a little bit. Um, so the next one for equitability is, is it free? Obviously, we know the app is probably not going to be free at this point. So there's something called um, the Netflix story. So what's the value of the input versus the output? So um, if you haven't heard before, Netflix, um, when they first, back in 2018, they were on the Apple App Store. And if you don't know this already, I'm about to let you know that Apple charges a really high rate for their developers in developing an app. So Netflix made um, $850 million that year, I think it was, and Apple ended up taking almost $250 million of it uh, just in their app costs just for hosting it. So essentially they were making $700,000 a day, Apple was, for virtually doing nothing of Netflix's money. So what ended up happening was Netflix redirected their users from the App Store to the website so that they could get full commission. Um, after that happened, uh, the App Store ended up shutting down to the global market for any kind of streaming services, so that's actually not allowed anymore. So um, the, the input versus the output in the concept of this entire thing is... Uh, what are we giving versus what are we giving back? So if we end up hosting our app on the app stores, we have to uh, be prepared to, to incur those fixed costs, okay? So our target price is um, based on the market, uh, what there is a market for is around $7 to $20. So that's the medium average. So the low average is around $6.99 and under. And then the high average is around $20 to $50. So if we end up charging between $7 and $20 for the app, we would be in the target price range, which is, which is great. Uh, users spend an average of three hours deciding if they want to buy an app at a target price versus the low-cost apps takes around 15 minutes. So what, here's why this is a big deal. If the app is priced at $6.99, a user will actually spend two hours and 45 minutes less deciding if they want the app. So if we charge $7 versus $6.99, which is essentially the same thing, it's only a cent off, there is a two hour and 45 minute window between that decision. So if we do end up deciding on the lower end, we are more likely to capture those people within the first 15 minutes and get those customers over the ones that are going to take two or three hours to decide and then they could eventually say no. So we want to make sure that we're capping on the market as much as we can. So it's a really important decision to decide how much is going to be charged for the app in its completion. And then for price ranges, the Apple Store costs around 15% of gross revenue on subscription models and there's a one-time fee of 30%. So if we are an app that decides to charge monthly, Apple is going to take 15% of our revenues for every download. Um, if it's a one-time fee where there's no additional uh, charges, they're going to take 30% of our overall revenue. And then there is um, just for hosting on the App Store in general, there's a $99 annual fee that's consistent every year. And I looked at Google Play, it's pretty much around the same prices. Um, they were talking about lowering the price. I, I, I know there's a lot of um, stuff going on in America right now when it comes to the average app prices and what these companies are charging. But nothing's actually been done yet. But there is supposed to be a lowering of these fees sometime soon in the next year or so. And then if we were to offer our app for free and we charge in-app fees. So basically the user can download the app for free, but then pay later for additional or extra sort of uses for certain things that that um, goes back to the 30% fee. So they don't charge the lower end of that. They charge the higher end. So that kind of sucks, but it is what it is. 
Um, those are the fees. Those would be the yearly fees. So it's important to sort of decide what we would end up be, um, being charged and what we would charge overall for the app in the long run. Okay, the next one is still equi equitability and is it foreseeable? So a few things about the app that would be um, some great opportunities for investment is, is it a potential educational tool that could be used in schools? Is it something that we could, you know, develop a presentation for, take it to the school board in any area and see if they could use it within their schools to help students? Another one is, could it be used in firms, companies, anything like that, anywhere where we could get a large quantity of people in a short amount of time? So if the app ends up being developed and is so helpful that it could help masses uh, com complete tasks or um, groups of people do things cohesively together, then this could be an opportunity to sort of explore other options in growing through markets. Um, another one is the beta version. So opening up with a beta version is probably the most um, important thing that we could do. Um, I know companies like Pinterest, for example, when they first started, they just um, opened it opened it up to a few people at a time, people that they had their emails and, you know, say like, hey, use this app, give it a try. How do you feel about it? And then as they sort of worked out all the kinks and all the bugs, that's when they sort of opened it up to the global market. So Harvard did a really good study on testing in a market using three strategies. When should a test be conducted? What can you learn from the test market? And how should you use the data pulled from the test market? So if we can follow these structures, we should be able to get a really good grasp on when we need to do testing, what we can learn from that testing, what our ultimate goals are, and what could we potentially do with the data gathered. So just getting data is one thing. Having data in your pocket is one thing. It can be really valuable just on its own, just sitting there. But doing something with it and figuring out how it can be utilized to be better is what's really valuable. It's what's really going to, you know, make your market grow, make you money. All right. And the last one for equitability is the incentives. So the incentives, consumers respond to incentives in general. Um, Types of incentives for apps would be sales prices. So obviously, it's not, you don't really see sale prices on apps. It tends to not be a good look. But if you were to go buy something in the store, a sale price would be, you know, the law of demand just sort of falls into place. Um, but one really good idea for um, incentives for apps would be, you know, a, a subscription type model where... Uh, they can get one month at $12.99 or buy three months for $24.99 or buy the entire year for $69.99. That gives us a larger revenue quicker by incentivizing uh, consumers to buy for the entire year versus just buying a month at a time. A month at a time can be really good for slow growth, but if we really want that fast money in the in the beginning then we want to incentivize them for a year and then they have the actual app for a year but can marketing towards people who are going to purchase for the entire year is a little bit different than marketing towards the people who are just going to buy for the month because it's easier to get people to spend $12.99 than it is to get them to spend $70 um, pay only after six months. So that's a great one if you just if you're really confident in the solution, which I think we are, uh, you can get it so that they don't have to pay in the beginning and then they pay later, essentially. So this is a lot of the times these types of things, um, a company that's really, really well known for doing this is Microsoft. So they incentivize consumers all the time for things like Xbox, um, any kind of gaming systems. They, they really just, they offer free things all the time. But then later on, it gets charged to your credit card and you don't even think about it. You don't even know about it. So that's a really good way to 
develop the consumer right off the bat, be confident in our product, make sure that we know that it's going to last, it's going to work, and then tell the tell the customers like, hey, we're going to charge you later for it, don't even worry about it. Uh, trial periods, that's another really good way to do things. It's kind of ties in with the first month free. So we offer a 30-day trial period. They get to use the product for 30 days, figure out whether or not they like it or not, figure out whether it's a value to them or not, and then move into a paid subscription after that. Um, knowing the target audience. So college students might not respond the same way as teens or adults. So we sort of talked about this a little bit earlier. Knowing the target audience is going to be based around the marketing and advertising of something. So for our digital assets, if we are going to, I'm, I'm going to say, say, we'll say college students and then we'll say um, younger teens. The way we market to college students is not going to look the same as how we market to younger adults. So teens in their 16, 17, 18, 19 teens, they might be more focused on their friendships, might be more focused on themselves, might be more focused on you know their education, whether or not they have a new car, whether or not they have a job. Um, older adults would be focused more on family, would be focused more on their long-term career, would be focused more on, on health, things like that. So we want to make sure that our target audience is meet, being marketed the correct way. So if we're going to incentivize who's more likely, the adult with more money is going to be more likely to spend a higher quantity of money than the team with a minimum wage job. So we want to make sure that we're hitting those markets right exactly where they need to be. Okay, and finally, we are moving into sustainability. So this is the digital funding and the crowdfunding of everything. So this boils down to how are we getting money to support our cause? How are we getting as much finances as possible to support the backing of this project? So sources of funding can come from a few different places. So it's not just crowdfunding. That would be my primary um, role for this but there is a lot of way that we can get funding so a few ways would be crowdfunding e-commerce solutions so if we were to deci decide to um, build like a marketplace or you know make merchandise and sell it on Amazon or Shopify or something like that or even come up with our own solution on a website this is an additional way we can make money Another thing is subscriptions. So there's different ways we can subscribe to things. It's not just app markets. We don't just need the app to develop um, our income. We can find other ways to develop the brand and the company as a whole that actually makes us money. So this can come from, you know, making t-shirts that say like quality on it or uh, whatever whatever we are passionate about when it comes to the company, we can make merchandise around that uh, for a really low cost and then sell it at a high cost to consumers. Uh, the next one is venture uh, loans and investors. So this is probably the big one most people think about when they think of getting money and garnering money for business solutions, but it's not the only one. But it is a primary source of funding. Usually investors require equity. Uh, within the company. So being a startup, we don't want to give away too much equity, but we don't want to kind of hold on to it too because we want to make sure we're getting enough money to make sure that the company lasts and it continues to move forward. Data. Um, there's a few things around data when it comes to funding, but we'll talk about those. Uh, the next one is government. So we're very lucky being in Canada that the government supports small businesses so well. We don't have the population of the United States, so we're far more likely to get really good funding for a new business opportunity than you would be in the United States. So we're going to talk about a few options for that. Uh, the next one is sponsorships. This is something that I did a lot as a child before I was legally allowed to work in Canada. I would get sponsorships online uh, for people who wanted to support my causes when I was doing website building. So sponsorships are a really good way. It's basically a handout of money uh, to support your dreams or your goals. And then fundraising. Fundraising is... A good opportunity to sort of get the name out there, get the branding out there, and get money in return for something. It's not a whole lot of money, but it's enough money that at least we're making our presence known. Um, it's going to be a company you hear about in the future. We're going to 
you know, let people know, like you should keep this in mind. And this, this kind of just gets the wheel spinning. Um, you know, word of mouth is a really, really, really good way to market. It really is. As long as we've got the right branding in place, we've got the right energy in place, we can really get people hooked on the company early on because they believe in us as long as we're clear on what we're doing. And that's a really good way to move forward in the industry in general. Okay, so we're going to start off with funding with crowdfunding. So there's a few sites out there that actually offer crowdfunding opportunities. You might have heard of some of them. So crowdfunding is about engagement with the client and potential customers. So it's not just the consumer themselves, it's potential clients and investors. So when it comes to crowdfunding, there the sites that I think of first and foremost are things like Patreon. Patreon um, is basically a support system where you know, you show off your talents, you show off what you're building, you kind of have to give the consumers a little bit of introspection on what it is you're building. So you gotta let them know, like you can do this through YouTube videos or posting ads, anything like that, just talking about your product, and then people will give you money. Um, the next one will be Kickstarter. We've pretty much everyone at this point has heard of Kickstarter. They've done a really good job with their reputation. It's basically a platform for people to give money that believe in the startup. So you could almost not even have begun your startup and you could just tell them the concept and people will give you money for that. Um, so it's, it's basically a place where your idea alone could be enough as long as it's presented properly. And the next one is Indiegogo. So this one's kind of had an up and down reputation in the past. It's campaign based crowdfunding. So you put out these campaigns and then you're kind of getting income flow as the campaigns are being produced. So anything could happen with that one. It's a little bit more risky. Uh, the next one is circle up. So this one is equity based. You're basically offering equity of your company for income. Excuse me. So that would be, that's one option. It's not um, the best one, but it is an option. Worst comes to worst. If it's something we could do, if it's even offering 1% worth the equity for a certain amount, once the company has more value, uh, it might be worth it in the long run, you know? So, and moving along with business loans, if you're willing to take out business loans, then we could go to the lending club. So the lending club is an American based company for loans. So the one good thing about getting an American loan is converted to Canada. Our dollar is really good right now versus America. So getting a loan in America, even at a low interest rate or high interest rate, our conversion rate still ends up being quite high. And then we have subscription based funding. So this is an option should our marketing, if we end up developing a really good marketing strategy, or we have one in place that's really, really strong and consistent and seems to do well over time for a long period of time we can do subscription based funding so that would be something like OnlyFans so OnlyFans is still pretty new um, it's still sort of up in the air whether or not it's going to be the next big thing but it is something where we could just have constant income and develop that consumer base for understanding what the company is and what the company does the next one is love money. So if you've ever heard the term, love money is basically free money. So love money can come from anyone supporting the business and it's not taxable. So the, the money is tends to be given as a gift. So it could come from friends and family, but I don't know about you, but my family is not going to be handing me out money for my ventures anytime soon. So other opportunities are patient capital. So this is money that gets given to you and it's repaid later when there's profit in the company. Uh, the another one is um, investors that are willing to invest if they're going if they're sure they're going to get a healthy return on their investment. So accounting would probably be better off helping with this, but um, if you know for sure that there's going to be you know a predictable future, you know for sure that the profits are going to be there, uh, the predictions are solid based on everything that goes on, then you're going to get that healthy return and investors are more likely to invest. Another one is an IOU, so it's basically like a shark loan. Um, 
so someone would give you money and you say you pay it back later. So these these are really light ways of potentially getting money. But with the right person, many of these actually do work better than expected. Uh, another thing is handouts. So handouts would be if you were at a fundraiser or you were at a trade show. Trade shows are a really, 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 really good way for tech startups to get known and to meet investors. So lobbying for financial causes. So say we have a cause, say, you know, we want human consciousness to become a really, really good um, foundation for our cause. And we believe that we can mathematically predict human consciousness. We can, we believe that we can turn it into a solution that could be used in schools and companies. And it's going to end up, we're going to go down in history for this, you know, all of those grand things that, that, that if they work out would be great and I totally believe in them um, we can lobby for that so we can take this to a trade show and basically lobby it and ask for handouts um, another thing is fundraising so like we talked about earlier doing fundraisers anything um, contests contests seems to really hit com consumers really well they seem to really be engaged with contests anything that offers incentives where they can win free things essentially will get them involved and sponsorships like we talked about earlier again sponsorships are there are companies online that we can apply for that offer sponsorships there's uh, scholarships and grants that allow companies to sort of, especially emerging companies, to get sponsorship, which is money you basically don't have to pay back at any point. It's a gift given to you. And another one is donations. So accepting donations on the website or accepting donations just by going around knocking on people's doors is always an option. It doesn't exactly drive a lot of money, but it drives enough where we could potentially complete a task or complete a goal. So the next one is data. So making a deal with the devil for data. So it works a little bit differently in Canada than it does in the United States. The United States have a lot of different laws around the personal selling of um, personal and private data. So in Canada, we're a little bit stricter with our rules around that. So it's some, we have something called PEPIDA, which is the Personal Information Protection and Electronics Document Act in Canada. So we fundamentally cannot sell data that's personal and risks the privacy of the consumer. So we can't just essentially put a consumer's well-being at risk. We can't just go around selling the data that we uh, get with the app. So if we come up with, um, if we say we end up having 500 million users, uh, we can't just go and sell their, their data. Um, it's, it's a sad reality, but it is what it is, but it is only within Canada. So moving to the United States, it's a little bit different. They've heard, they have something called the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, you might have already heard of that before. But they do allow the sale of private data as long as it – there's a few regulations around that. But as, essentially as long as the consumer agrees to it, which usually the 99% of people don't even read the terms of use. They just sort of – sign it and move on, click forward. It tends to be like 10 pages long, so nobody really wants to read it. Um, you are, you do have the right to exchange data. One thing you can do within Canada and the United States is the results of data. So if you end up coming up with a new solution to something, say you use the data of, you know, 500 million people and you came up with a solution that, um, prove that you know consciousness comes from um you know space using molecular i'm not like a science major but you know what i'm saying if you end up coming up with a solution around the results of the data then you are able to collectively sell that information so and there is really really big money in that um most investors will invest in companies just solely based on the data that you are collecting. So there's a difference between sharing and selling data. It works the same way. You can't freely give out someone's data. 
Uh, you can't freely share data with other companies or just sell it for money. Um, but the, the difference would be sharing data is kind of like exchange data. Um, I give you this data, you give me that data. We can kind of co cohesively get it to work um, in a lock between the two things and we can potentially develop a new technological solution around that data. Um, it's ideal, it sounds great in theory, but it works a little bit differently, again, between the two countries. So we're going to have to collectively, I guess, as a unit, figure out how we can sort of get around some and work around some of these um, restrictions so that we are complying with all laws, but we are also able to um, use the data in an effective way that's going to essentially make us money. And yeah, is the data profitable and is it revolutionary to other industries? So essentially, data is so valuable because it comes up with new innovations for humankind. It comes up with new understanding of the human, understanding of the person, understanding of the consumer. Um, with the evolution of data, we've been able to realize, you know, what collectively it is that people want, what it is they're drawn to, what it is, you know, they they see something, what makes them go to it, what makes them stick to it, you know, what gets them hooked, what gets them to fall in love with it. And this is a, the bigger picture. This is the value of the data. So with what we're building, there's real potential in the usefulness of the data. And in the long run, we are more likely to be a more profitable and more valuable company as a result of that. So assuming we're collecting the data in a way that we can store it and then use it later on in a way that continues to allow us to innovate and create new technology, then we are on the right path. All right. Um, oh, sorry. We are at government. So this is probably our best option when it comes to getting a lot of money quickly. So the government in Canada, um, because our population is a little bit lower, well, a lot lower than the United States, we tend to be very accessible to income for small businesses, startup businesses, technology businesses, things like that. So a few opportunities to get money from the government uh, look something like loans, grants, and subsidies. So we have, uh, there's a labor and a wage subsidy. So essentially the government pays for the labor and the wage, or at least a percentage of it, um, for any kind of company that's a startup. Uh, the other one is business loans. So if you've ever heard of it, there's a company called BDC, and they work with the Canadian government on providing capitalistic like venture loans to new companies starting up. Other ones are business grants. So business grants are money you do not have to pay back. So essentially, you are given money just for being a startup in Canada, just for being a company in Canada. It's kind of like a thank you for helping our country progress. Uh, the next one is capital investments. So these are equity lines. So essentially, we would get a venture capitalist, someone within BDC, for example, to invest in the company. They give us a certain amount of money for a certain percentage of the equity. Uh, another benefit is tax credits. So we have a really, really great tax policy in Canada, Canada for businesses. Um, we have a we offer a lot of tax benefits when it comes tax time to that give you a lot of your money back that you had paid in throughout the year. And then the next one is Canada Small Business Financing Program. So essentially what this would be is uh, they finance the company um, or at least a percentage of it. So we sign up for the program and we get a certain amount maybe monthly or yearly that helps finance the overall consistency of the company. And then there's a few subsidies for hiring students. So particularly women in STEM, that's me. And then you would get something like anywhere between five and 15,000 towards the company just for hiring someone like me. Okay, and then next we have investors. So investors are people who give money to the company for usually equity in the business or other deals like royalties or licensing deals. So types of investors include business incubators. So these are accelerators that help build the business when the business needs money. 
Um, so they kind of come in, the business say is failing for some reason, and they they give you money to help kind of bring it back up to where it was before. Uh, the next one is serial entrepreneurs. These are the ones that are the crazy people that just go and invest in everything and they're just obsessed with, you know, businesses and making money because they want like that seven flows of income or whatever it is. And you just, you know, you basically sell them the business. You tell them why they should invest. They're going to get their money back in X, Y, Z amount of years or X, Y, Z amount of months. And they put in their interest. So it might be a really low percentage of equity. It might be a royalty. It might be anything um, around those lines. Uh, the next one is private in, uh, investors. So private investors raise startup capital for the company. So private investors are kind of like the people you never see. They would be on the board. They'd be on the chair, but they wouldn't really have any say in the company. And they're, they're just there. Um, they show interest in the company and they sort of they have probably experience around building businesses from scratch, so they'll be able to go and network with other investors that they've worked with in the past, and they would help raise capital for the company initially. So it's almost like a really good friend. And then you have angel investors. Angel investors just give you money. They invest in the company, but they expect nothing in return. So these are, you know, everyone sort of hopes and prays for an angel investor, right? Uh, someone that just sort of walks in and believes in the company and decides to invest um, with, with the no expectation of getting their money back. They just believe in the company and they want it to succeed. Okay, so other ways of making money. So these are two shirts I put together as merchandise opportunities. So if we, these are digital ways that we could make money that don't require losing any equity in the business or don't require offering anything up. So there's opportunity to hire internships. So and summer students and co-ops. So hiring students is really beneficial because they tend to require a low pay for a high job rate. So essentially, um, internships and summer students and co-op students, they're working as a placement towards their degree. So they're willing to take less money just because they want to get the job to, to cover their degree requirements. So there, there's a lot of, first and foremost, there's a lot of um, grants and bursaries around just hiring them in general for that reason from the government but then also they're willing to take less pay so in the long run that saves us a lot of money and just overall another one is when the company becomes a little bit more profit profitable you can sell shares in the company um, for low stakes which just in general would make us money and make us more valuable overall another opportunity is to invest taking the investments and putting them in stocks and cryptocurrency. So it's a high risk right now. Cryptocurrency, for example, has a high volatility rate. So it's, it's a little bit risky. We could put, you know, $100,000 into the cryptocurrency market, whether it be Bitcoin, Stellar, Litecoin, any of those, and it could fall, but it could also jump and we could double our money. So it's really about whether or not we're willing to take that risk um, in general. And, in the long run, it might pay off, but it's something that right now, it's not like the market's changing every 24 hours in massive extent. So we'd basically be putting our money there and holding it. Uh, the next one is social media. So social media, you can make really, really good money off social media as long as you have the right audience. So in my past, I've made you know one YouTube video with half a million views, um, brings in like eight, to a thousand dollars a month for six months so essentially if we could get a, a develop which is something like i would take responsibility for we would develop a youtube channel that you know promotes these videos regularly whether it be weekly or monthly um and regards to the company or the app or any other venture that we decided to take uh technological wise uh, we could develop a consumer base and a subscription model around um, consumers in that way that could, you know, where we could post ads and get in with partners that uh, help us make some additional money. So, and it's, it's always good for exposure, right? And then the online store, the e-commerce market. So retail is not obviously, you know, it's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is around, you know, technology and everything like that. But 
um, retail, just the exposure of just creating merchandise and having people buy it. Um, right. We would obviously need a reason for them to buy it. So we would want to develop some sort of marketing where, uh, it's appealing to the eye it could have funny quotes. It could have, you know, sayings from famous people, anything like that, and just develop some sort of merch. Um, you see up there, I have, a put together just some t-shirts with the Qualia computing, uh, what the, something like that would look like. It's just a base logo. It's not, there's no specification around it, but it's just something just to get the idea flowing in your head, just if it's something you might be interested in. And then the last one is bank loans. Bank loans is nobody, nobody's favorite ones. It's the one, you know, it tends to be high interest. We don't want to have to pay back. We don't want to have to go in debt. That's obviously the unappealing factor of it is you don't want to build debt on the company before it's even profitable. So, but it is an option if we are really strapped for cash for something. Uh, here's a few of the costs that would be required when it comes to um, the overall pursuits of this. So I've gone past the hour mark here, so I'm just getting closer to finishing up. So we're just gonna cover this quickly. So here are some of the costs that we would be looking to endure in the future. So trade shows, for example, tend to cost money. Um, putting together a really good trade show, you, even though you get the opportunity to meet investors and marketers and anybody willing that could be beneficial to the company, trade shows are a really good place for that. Um, but it's lobbying with expense, essentially. So we would have to put away costs for that. Travel costs, you know, I don't know where everybody in the company lives, but we all live technically away from each other. So um, there could be travel costs for whether or not be seeing people, but also if we were to, you know, travel to the States for a trade show or travel somewhere around the world for a trade show, all of these things cost money. So we put some aside a cost for travel costs. Uh, the next one is digital marketing and acquisition costs. So essentially acquisition costs would be getting the customer, how much is it going to cost to get that customer and how are they going how long are they going to engage with us for? So if the customer is really valuable, it might be worth it to spend, you know, three to five dollars getting them versus, you know, 30 cents just for the impression. So in the beginning, new companies tend to spend around 12% on their marketing fees. So that's a quite a high number. You, we want to keep it down within the lower like 7%, 5% range. But in the beginning where it is a startup more or less, we want to make sure that we are really building that consumer base and we're really getting solid, strong consumers that are going to be lasting with us. We, we essentially want that loyalty. We want to develop that loyalty with our consumers where they go around telling all their friends to use us because we're the best and no one's going to beat us. And we're in it for the long run, right? So that's it's worth it to engage and invest that money into acquisition costs for the long run. The next one is fixed costs like labor costs, app store costs, any kind of reoccurring costs that's going to happen continuously. Those are all going to have to be accounted for. Uh, trial and error, version testing, and quality assurance. So this would all come just not only with the beta versions, but with any kind of um, additional testing. All of this is going to cost something that's called implicit cost. So this is time spent on doing things. So we're all going to be in the beginning, more or less, investing our time for the company. Um, it's not all going to be the same as when the company is really successful and the company is sort of flowing on its own and it doesn't really need as much attention anymore. It doesn't need as much babying then those implicit costs go down. But for now, essentially, it's a lot of hands-on, a lot of hard work, a lot of putting in the time and effort, um, a lot of trial and error, testing, version controls, and making sure the quality is just right. So all of that comes at a cost. Uh, the next one is servers and data storage. So I think we all know that, that, that that's a really big expense. Um, making sure the app runs smoothly, making sure the data can be held, making sure nothing ever shuts down, making sure it's consistent, constantly consistent, and that comes at a premium price. The next one is equity and capital. So anything um, within the company that's an asset, a digital asset or an, an actual physical tangible asset would be like computers, cell phones, anything like that. 
those things all cost money. We want to make sure that our engineers have the best of the best. We want to make sure that they have everything that they need to be successful in their roles. Uh, we want to make sure that you know everyone on the board would be happy. We want to make sure that everyone's essentially has everything they need to succeed. And then unexpected unexpected costs so new technology for example so say we it could be anything from like a wordpress theme to an entirely new metal for something we're building it's a, it could be anything unexpected costs come as they say unexpectedly so it's important to have money set aside at the very least for anything that might show up and then the last one is merchandise. So costs would be if we did decide to go the route of developing merchandise for the company, getting those materials and getting those things made and essentially initially would cost money. So we're going to need to put away costs for that. All right, moving on to exit strategy. So I don't want to be the bearer of bad news and they say you should never talk about the exit, especially in a company that you're just starting. But I think it's better to be safe than sorry, and it's really important to have those things in place um, should anything arise. So first and foremost when it comes to business is bankruptcy. So bankruptcy is the Hail Mary of everything. It's so easy. More people should do it. I totally support it. Um, whether it be personal or business, bankruptcy is the out. Um it's really, really easy to do. You just go to um, Insolvency. You, you know, get someone to cancel everything out, and you, essentially everything's gone. Uh, the only thing you really can't go bankrupt on is um, taxes, so overdue taxes or unpaid back taxes, essentially within the government. So if the company was to ever fail or anything was to ever go wrong. Um, any money that's already in the account or any money that's already saved would have to pay out those back taxes and then the company could go bankrupt in full and then everyone's free and clear. It's really, really easy. Every like More people should do it, whether it be personally or business-wise. It's a really great solution to thing. Um, bank liens are basically collateral for debt. So like a car, if we ended up getting a loan and someone you know in the company decided to put their house on the line for that or put their car on the line for that, um, if the debt isn't repaid, basically it could be seized. So it's important to be accountable for that. This is more financing and accounting stuff, but I think it's really good that we all sort of understand our place in there and understand everything that's going on within the company and what would need to happen for this type of thing. If anything, especially if we all develop, uh, equity in the company, we should all understand where the company's finances are at and understand, um, overall what it would look like. And then defaulting on the loan, whether it be secured debt or an unsecured debt, um, defaulting would just put everything to collections. And then if we were to go bankrupt, collect the bankruptcy would handle all of the collections. So essentially, um, even if it was in collections, it would affect the credit, but it, it would still be washed away. Um, and then the next one is never raise the price on consumers to get out of debt. Uh, this is a really, really big one. You see that happening a lot when companies are struggling. They'll raise the price on a product and then consumers just get pushed more away. They don't actually get drawn more to the product because it went up in price. Um, you know, it's the law of supply and demand. Um, something goes down in price, the consumer is going to want to buy more of it. So you, we don't want to lose the customers we already have, even if the company is going down. We want to make sure that we're passionate and in love with the company and the brand as much as possible. Um, that we don't we don't give up on it, right? We don't we believe in it all the way through. We go the whole way with it. Um, I'm I don't want to I don't want to ever have to um, give up on something that I'm passionate about or, or that I believe in, and I don't think anybody within the company would feel that way either. So it's really important that we just you know stick to our guns, stick to our plan keep moving forward and believe in it enough and we don't want to lose the customers that we do develop because the company could always bounce back. You know, you always hear about these successful companies bouncing back and that is always the goal. So if things ever do go awry, these are our oats, but essentially we want to believe in the company enough that we stick it out and we keep moving forward. Um, but in the event something ever was to happen, we could just wash our hands of it. It's not that big of a deal. All right, so we're finishing up here. Um, 
taken a lot of your time today and I'm really really grateful for that so we're just going to finish up with the some of the good parts so that is the money that's freely available to us so these are some Canadian government and business grants I'm not going to read through all of these but I've put together a little piece at the end but these are all things the company currently we are eligible for right now um, there's tons of them, tons of them. These are all Canadian based. They're all Canadian wide. I think there's one that's just Western Canada only. So that would be everyone that's over in uh, Victoria, over in BC there. Um, you'd be eligible for those, but essentially these are all Canada wide, uh, technology or otherwise startup, uh, grants, business loans, anything available to us right now that we could get funding in. So here is, um, uh, consolidated piece of all of that so if you look at the numbers here we're looking at millions essentially just 10 million R&D projects and um, there's one grant for 150k for the proof of concept but then if we have the prototype which we will with the app it goes up to a million dollars um, interactive software which is what we would be um, that's 1.5 million. That's a that's a grant for that. There's a million dollars in business loans, so that would come at um, a premium. So we would have to pay interest. Uh, there is seventy five thousand dollars just in grants alone. Uh, so that's money we don't have to pay back. It's just given to us. There is a million dollars in diversity funds. So the more um, people that end up being hired in the long run of a diverse background, um, we get a million dollars for that. Uh, 7,500 in internships. So I talked about this a little bit earlier when it comes to hiring students um, for internships because it goes towards their degree. So they're more concerned about that than the actual money that they make. Um, we actually get money for just hiring them for internships. So that's basically they're paying their own salary. So we basically get employees for free. Um, the next one is 25k in innovation and academic partnerships. So what ends up happening is universities end up working with the government towards funding uh, new innovation startups. So we would get money from the government through we would get money from the government that comes from universities essentially just for being an innovative startup company. And then there's five to 10 million for technology startups. So obviously this is a really good one for us. This is a really good chunk of change for us. It's tech, we have a technology startup, so we would basically be eligible for that. Um, 700K in insurance funds in the government risk. Okay, so this is, essentially it's insurance on the company. So the government takes all the risk and liability from the company. I know it's, it's sometimes it sounds too good to be true, but it is. And we are basically scot free and they give us insurance money essentially. So we can have insurance on everything and the government takes all the risk and liability towards that. Uh, the next one is 500 K for commercializing technology. So we are, after looking at uh, the qualifications for that, we are a commercialized technology company, so we would get that 500K. And these are um, amounts that are per year, so $4 million per year for testing and development of new technology. So based on what it is we're actually doing with um, you know, conscientiousness and building that up and um, the con continued research and development part of it, um, we would be eligible for that $4 million every year just to get that. And then a million dollars in grant funding for R&D projects. So we are, this is another million that we could potentially get every year just for the research and development of what it is we're doing. So we would probably have to yearly, you know, send in all of our research, everything we've come up with, all of that data that we end up to have developed over the last year, and then we would be eligible for that million dollars. Um, and then job grants. So this is for additional skills training. So 50% to 100% of a person's wage just for skills training. So if any of us wanted to travel somewhere and, you know, increase our skills and, you know, whatever technology, business, engineering, anything like that, um, basically all of that training costs would be covered. And then next is 50% wage coverage on youth employment. So this is a Canadian incentive to hire uh, new grads or students out of high school or anybody with any kind of um, skill that might be relevant to our company. Uh, the government is willing to pay 50% of their wage. So we don't actually have to fully um, pay. So say we offer, you know, 
a new student right out of grad school, like $46,000 a year, the government is going to take, you know, 23,000 of that and pay it for us. Uh, and then 30K for a six to 12 month of hiring new grads. So hiring new students right out of university or right out of um, community college, uh, we would get subsidy for a partial amount of their wage. So the 30 grant would be um, within the first six to 12 months, assuming they last that long. So we have a new student. So basically the probation period after a, stu after a person's probation period, excuse me, if we still decide to keep them around, then um, they're essentially a full-time employee and the government will give us $30,000 for that. Okay, I don't wanna take up too much more of your time, but I have one more thing I wanna talk about. And that is the sustainable development goals. So these are uh, something that every company on earth should have in their uh, business plan, in their business model. Everyone, every company should, honestly, it should be a legal requirement. But um, these are the problems on the planet. And these are the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that um, focus on the areas that our planet needs to improve on. So we have poverty, for example. So if poverty was a primary um, responsibility or something we were really passionate about and helping, then it's something we could say, you know, we believe in this. We could even utilize it in a way where, um, you know, we do... Um, campaigns around it or we do campaigns to support it you know apple does the um the red they have the actually have one here the red phone for you know certain causes and things like that um zero hunger good health and well-being quality education gender equality clean water and sanitation affordable and clean energy decent work and economic growth industry innovation and infrastructure reduced inequalities Sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnership for, I won't be able to see that, but, and one thing that I wish was on here that I think should be on here, but it's not, is human trafficking. I think human trafficking is also an issue around the world, uh, whether it be child labor or you know, sex work or anything like that, that tends to be an issue that goes along in a lot of countries around the world. So I think it should be on the 17 and make it 18 goals, but it's not right now. But anyway, we should figure out a sustainable uh, development goal that we believe in that we can cohesively agree on. And even just as a starting point to say, like, we have developed this together and, um, we this is how we work together and this is what we believe in in our business model and this is something we could present to people just to sort of get them all i think on board i think it's every company's responsibility to take on at least one of these within the corporation um in general it's just the right thing to do it's just something i believe in universities are kind of getting on board now um, teaching students about the importance of these when it comes to working in companies just to try to encourage new developments in companies um, so when new students graduate they go into the company you know knowing this and they sort of bring that knowledge into the company and kind of get companies on board with this this is collectively around the entire world. Every country in the world collectively has these issues as one. Like climate action, we all know we need to take care of the planet. We all know that that's the most urgent issue right now to deal with. We all know that poverty is an issue around the world. And we have a responsibility, a human responsibility, um, especially eventually being a company with a lot of money. We have a responsibility to kind of consider these actions, cons consider these problems and um, not make light of them and find some sort of solution or way that we can help within the business. Whether it be, you know, making t-shirts that promote the knowledge of these sustainable development goals. Um, it's a way we can make money uh, based off the problems. You know, but we're still helping in our own right. So I, ju I just think there's a lot of opportunity there. I want to bring those to everyone's attention. I think it's important and it's really worth knowing about. So if you haven't heard about them, I encourage you to strongly look them up. Um, and yeah, that 
is all for my presentation. So parting is such sweet sorrow. I bid you adieu. This is a line from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Adieu is a French word meaning goodbye. So thank you for watching my video today. My um, That is the conclusion of the values proposal. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Bye.